So we're being told many things about um, the damages that cows and red meat do to our planet and how unethical they are to eat. So number one, the methane, right? Number two, we're all going to die if we eat it. So, and I can uh, tell you, in the town I live in, it's, um, I live in a upscale suburb outside of Boston, and people are pretty well-educated, very health conscious. Um, nobody eats red meat. They're, they're really, really concerned about their cholesterol and their overall health, and they eat fish and chicken. And I, um, I'm very upset about this, and I, I want to um, help people understand that red meat is incredibly nutrient dense. Um, at the same time, we're also being told that meat is murder. Um, it's especially strong in Europe. Uh, I was just reading in France that uh, there's a vegan group that's been uh, vandalizing butcher shops. Um, we're seeing stuff going on in Canada with um, the one restaurant. Um, yeah, that uh, was being harassed. So uh, they're, a, they're a small but very vocal minority that actually is having quite an influence, I think, in our dietary guidelines because even the less meat, better meat is a problem, I think. Because when we say less meat, it's still implying that it's somehow bad, right? So what I think is we need more better meat, not less meat, better meat. Um, particularly upsetting to me are the s public schools in Brooklyn um, and um, a couple other in, in the New York area. Uh, right now, I think there's three that um, have gone completely vegetarian. Uh, for many kids, this is their most nutrient-dense meal of the day, or it used to be, before they got rid of the meat. Um, the organization that is behind this is a vegan front group. Um, uh, underneath a very um, benign name like, you know, Moms for Healthy Lunches, or so, it was something like that. And um, they also will send you these free posters to your school, peace on a plate, right? So this is going in our public schools. You can get this for free. This is a moral, you know, quasi-religious message, I would argue, that has absolutely no business being in a public school. Also, we've got Super Size Me, and if you, uh, you probably can't read the um, sub under here, but it's basically saying that kale is the most nutrient-dense food you can eat. Okay, people really, really believe this. And that's why um, the initial thesis for the film project was kale versus cow. Um, just talking about, like, you know, is kale really the superfood and what's going on with beef? Um, and then we're also seeing companies like Nestle completely going into developing countries, disrupting their um, breastfeeding and their traditional foods, and getting them completely hooked on uh, Western junk food. Um, in many places, you know, I'm sure many of you have traveled to uh, Central America, South America, or other um, developing uh, countries, and you know, it's like you've made it if you start eating. Western crap food, and if you've moved away from your traditional diet, right? Um, and so, you know, for many reasons, um, I think we need to get our act together in the U.S. and with our food policy issues because the rest of the world copies the U.S. And a couple of years ago, I did a presentation at AHS about should sustainability be part of our U.S. dietary guidelines. My argument was no because we don't even know what sustainability is, and so how can we possibly put that into our dietary guidelines? Again, uh, the entire world, if you look, almost every country has some type of pyramid that's based on the US dietary uh, pyramid, and you know, even though saturated fat is no longer a nutrient of concern, we're still you know, selling skim milk in schools. So um, there's just, there's huge problems. All right. Uh, a lot of times people will come to me and ask me, how are you going to feed the world, right? How are you going to do this? And this is a really big problem. Um, I, you know, I have a three bedroom Airbnb here. Um, and, you know, how to feed the world 
on meat would be like saying, how am I going to house everyone at this conference in my three-bedroom Airbnb, right? We have an overpopulation problem. We've got some food distribution problems and some food waste problems. But do we want to produce human feed or do we want to produce healthy people? Okay, so I, th I think that, um, you know, we need to use logic and less emotion when we're trying to talk about um, all the challenges that are um, facing us moving forward. Um, and I, I did send a, uh, I realized that this talk was only um, a half an hour this morning, um, and, I, and I sent a new presentation. I'm realizing I have the old one on here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk quickly through a couple of other slides. Um, as you know, vegetarians are not healthier. Um, when there's very large uh, studies that have looked at, um, you know, when you pull out all the confounding factors and just look at people uh, you know, of equal healthy lifestyle that uh, eat meat versus don't eat meat. There's absolutely no difference in longevity at all. Um, what the world is actually eating, um, this is from National Geographic, and you can play around. If you, if you Google uh, National Geographic what the world eats, you can play around with all these uh, country by country. This is the total world. And you can see, you know, very, very large percentage of grain. Uh, they unfortunately put sugar and fat in the same category. Um, I would not have chosen to do it this way. Um, uh, but then once we break out the meat, it's really just 1% beef that the world is eating. Um, and if you look also under produce, it's only 3% vegetables. So when we're trying to get people to, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables, that's always like, you know, at the farmer's markets with SNAP uh, benefits, you know, more fruits and vegetables, you know. I have a little bit of a problem. So in, in Massachusetts last summer, they introduced a program where people would get an extra 40 to $80 to spend at farmer's markets on local produce, right? And so they could get, you know, use their SNAP dollars for, you know, a $6 half pint of organic raspberries or maybe, you know, a $12 a pound mescaline mix. And meanwhile, what's going on with the meat vendors? New England is amazing at producing meat. They were not included in this. Why weren't they included? Is local meat too luxurious for a SNAP? You know, if we're trying to feed nutrient-dense food to hungry people, meat is the way to do it, not organic strawberries and mescaline mix. Uh, over, let's see, from 1970 to 2014, what we're eating more of, so the orange is um, what we ate in 1970, and the red is 2014. So you can see where the increases are. It's poultry, like crazy. Worldwide, I think it's about 400% increase in poultry. Guess what's really high in omega-6? Chicken. Um, we're eating a lot of salad and cooking oils. It's probably not, you know, coconut oil and, and olive oil. It's, it's a vegetable oils. Grains, and this is not pearl barley when they're talking about grains, right? What does grains mean? Grains just means processed food. Um, and then caloric sweeteners. But then when we're looking at the food, uh, the future of food, many organizations are, again, looking at this lab-grown lettuce or lab-grown meats as, you know, these are the answers to the future. But if you really think about, you know, all of the energy that it takes to have this building, to have the lights, to have the artificial atmosphere that's needed for this, um, the plastic trays, the growing medium, um, you know, and there's a roof on top of this building too. None of these seem to like have realized that, you know, if we just like had a glass top, we could actually use some solar, um, you know, to grow what? To grow crunchy water because uh, salad is just not a nutrient dense food. And of course, a lot of people are looking at, you know, is it the carbs, yes or no? Um, I know this is kind of like old news for a lot of you, but still, you know, out in, um, you know, regu regular, like, dietitian land, t suggesting that someone reduce their carbohydrate intake is blasphemy. Like, totally crazy stuff, right? Um, that's why I'm really excited about some of the work that we've been tracking in our film. And if I get a little time at the end, I'll talk about how it's transformed a little bit. 
Um, but we've been working a lot with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. I know someone um, earlier reviewed the results of the Verda study. Um, she's doing really, really incredible work in the middle of corn country, Lafayette, Indiana. Um, we have a film crew there today, actually, at her clinic, tra uh, following up for the third time with a lot of patients there. Um, and we actually have on film her getting disinvited from testifying to Congress because even though her study, they admitted, was completely, um, you know, scientifically rigorous, they all agreed with it, it was just too against the status quo. Okay. I still got to get permission from the person on the other end of the line in order to actually air that. Um, but it's amazing. It was amazing to just watch the call. Um, so uh, anyway, so I, I think that we really, we need to be, um, you know, definitely talking about all the nuance and learning about different aspects that um, affect health, like here at, at conferences like AHS, but there's still a lot of work to do on a very, very, very basic level um, to the masses, and that's why um, the work of Sarah is so exciting to me, and um, why our film is um, has has morphed a little bit and is really, really honing in on Sarah's work. Again, when we look at what the world eats, um, if we look at the meats, so you can separate it out by meats, what uh, the increase has been between 1961 and 2011, 0% uh, in beef, pork 91% up, poultry, here it is, almost 400% increase in poultry. Seafood 108% and um, at the same time though, I really just don't feel that um, we're eating enough protein. So. Um, the, the dietary guidelines are telling us 0.8 grams per kilogram, um, really, really good evidence out there that we need, at a bare minimum, double the RDA of protein. Um, if you look at this range, so if the, uh, the, um, the AMDR, the, um, let's say it's adjusted macro, daily macronutrient ratios, uh, recommend between um, 15 and 30 percent intake in carbohydrates, or I'm sorry, here we go, 10 and 35 is what this, uh, what these bars are, so the lower range is 10. We're pretty close to the lower range here, um, and I'm a big believer in the protein leverage hypothesis, so if we aren't feeding our bodies enough protein, we're going to seek out more calories just in our effort to try to get more protein in, and if we're only feeding ourselves the center of the grocery store, then we're just gonna overeat. Protein is the most satiating of the macronutrients. It's the most nutrient dense if we're getting it from animals. And, um, and I'm not the only person who is saying this. This is an article from the New York Times um, also saying we need at least double the RDA of protein if you're over 40. And that's a lot of protein. I actually calculated it out for my husband. Um, he's close to 200 pounds. At 1.6 grams per kilogram, he would need eight ounces of meat three times a day. That's a lot of protein, and not one person walking into my uh, clinic is getting close to that much. And the magical thing is when I just up their protein and like do nothing else, they lose weight. Because they're so full from the protein, they've got so much great nutrients just from good protein, they're not hungry. So I think there's, um, you know, there's a lot to keto, there's a lot to low carb, there's a ton going on with protein too. And I feel like um, protein is just sort of assumed at this given level. Um, but that's why I'm all for more better meat, not less meat, better meat. Because I don't think that's going to help our obesity crisis or our diabetes crisis. I think that's just going to help people feel better. Um, and people just need to get over it and um, accept the fact that death has to happen for life to happen and that uh, cows on grass can do a really amazing job at restoring our soils and providing one of the most perfect foods for humans. So let's look then, um, and again, for a lot of you, I know that this is review. Um, if we look at uh, calories per 30 grams of protein, We've got cod at 137 calories for 30 grams of protein. 
Um, and I took this off one of those vegan memes where they were like, you don't need to eat meat. You know, you, all you need is, and it was all these plant-based ones that I've got here. So um, potato didn't even fit on here um, as far as calories. But you can see, for example, peanut butter, you would need to eat 706 calories worth of peanut butter to get 30 grams of protein. So to try to get 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram out of plants and keep your calories low, it's a huge challenge. So you mu you're going to do better with veggie burgers and tofu, but then you've got other issues with veggie burgers and tofu, right? Um, if we look at protein per serving, so these are the standard USDA servings, you can see that um, Three and a half, uh, I know that this is small, but three and a half ounces of chicken will give you 31 grams of protein. But then we keep going down the line and it's meat, 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 meat. Eggs by, um, I just want to mention, are actually not fantastic sources of protein. There's only six grams of protein in a large egg. Um, so when I, when I have vegetarian clients coming in and they're like, oh yeah, but I eat a lot of eggs. And I'm like, great, that's two eggs a day. That's 12 grams of protein. That's not a lot. Um, so peanut butter, two tablespoons, eight grams of protein. So we've got all these ones down here. Now let's look at nutrient density too. So B12, iron, and zinc. Um, and I'm, I just compare different meats just so you can get a sense of where the, um, some of the nutrition, you know, some of the most significant nutrition that we need, iron and B12 are uh, the most common nutrient deficiencies worldwide. And so um, look down at, um, you know, the poultry. We've got almost no B12 in chicken or turkey, okay? Um, and I had to take oysters off this because they had 76 grams of zinc. All right, this goes up to six. <laughs> All right, so oysters are amazing. Um, I, I do advocate for red meat. I am a huge advocate for shellfish and fish as well. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to sort of point out, you know, uh, poultry, I've got a lot of issues with poultry, and it's, um, it starts with their nu nutrient density. Um, continues with their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And so if you look at, look at ground turkey, look at the omega-6 in ground turkey. Really, really high. Um, chicken breast. So there's not even like hardly any fat in chicken breast at all, but look at how much omega-6 it has. And this makes sense if you're a farmer because birds eat seeds and grains. Even if they're pastured, they still eat a lot of seeds and grains. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is um, I have seen a lot of data from different farms as far as their um, omega-6, omega-3 ratio for grass-fed beef, but it's still not a significant source of omega-3s. So you would still need to eat about eight pounds of grass-fed beef burgers to get the same omega-3s that you would get in a one ounce piece of fish, okay? They're just not a significant source. And so I think, you know, to increase your omega-3s and to reduce your omega-6s, your best bet is to eat more wild fish and to completely eliminate processed foods not to eat more grass-fed beef. I, I think grass-fed beef is awesome. It's just, it's, it, the omega-3 argument is not really great because it's just not a significant source. But lab meat, I really, really hate. <laughs> um, and again, just like I pointed out with the vertical farming um, and how it just doesn't make sense when you could be using just sunlight and put the seeds in the ground and watch them grow, um, we could have cows on grass and I'm going to be pointing out a little bit later how, how efficient they are at um, transforming grass to meat. Um, the thermodynamics absolutely cannot work in a lab meat system. Um, I think people are walking around thinking, and I actually challenged, I had a, um, an animal welfare activist on my podcast uh, that I'm going to be airing maybe next week. And she was all for lab meat. Oh, it's so great because it's less harm. And, you know, nutritionally it's good. And, you know, it's going to be saving the environment. And I'm like, really? Because how are you going to grow that lab meat? Like, what's it going to be made out of? You can't just make something out of nothing. And she had never even thought about what 
the meat was going to be made of. And I don't think anyone's thinking about that. And I'm still looking for a life cycle analysis from Impossible Burger. They still have not produced one. And they're getting so much money. And they don't even have a full soup to nuts exactly how their product is made, what are, the, what are all the energetic inputs, what are all the, uh, just all of the inputs in general, what does it cost to run the lights in this lab, uh, bacteria overgrowth, do you think that might be a problem in a lab meat situation? Totally. Um, I'll tell you what the medium is for making uh, lab meat, monocrops. Okay, and this is, an, they're not using like organic, regenerative wheat or something like that. They're just using standard monocrops. So whether it's soy or corn or wheat or just pick a monocrop because they, they, can, they can use a lot of different ones in order to produce these fake meats. It's absolutely horrible. This is not what the planet should be looking like. And we are turning the whole planet into one large monoculture. And not just agriculturally, but I also think culturally. That's a different presentation. Um, and the problem is we only have about 60 years left if we continue with our current farming practices. This is pretty scary stuff that no one's really talking about. And certainly no one in the nutrition field is talking about it. So as all the nutritionists that are talking about sustainability are talking about lab meat. Nature works in systems. Um, I actually drew this, and I do promise that I was an art major undergrad. Um, but I drew this because I wanted to, uh, in this cartoonish way, because I wanted to show you absolutely how simple this process is. So it's vastly complex, but it's actually really simple. So the rain comes down, irrigates the grass. Um, the cow chews the grass, stimulating the grass to grow. Fertilizes the grass for free. We don't need chemical fertilizers. Um, we can use photosynthesis and um, this whole process then builds soil carbon and increases soil health. Um, we don't have to mine minerals to, you know, per, put it into the lab meats. The, the fungi networks are doing the mining for us. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a little thought experiment called Grass World. How much time do I have left, by the way? Okay, great. Okay. All right. So here's Grass World. So we're m moving into the um, Anthropocene. We've got limited resources left. I'm going to give you a big island, and I want you to farm this regeneratively. Okay? And so there's nothing to eat. There's just, just dirt there. And so you, being a smart person, are like, well, I've got to cover the soil, so I'm going to plant some grass. All right. What happens if we don't have anything eating the grass? We just keep the grass growing. Yes. If there's nothing eating it and nothing fertilizing it, the grass is going to eventually use up all the you know, nutrients in the ground. It's going to shrivel up and die, which I just heard is happening in Norway right now, right? <laughs> yeah. OK, because they're, they have less ruminants on the ground in Norway. OK, so next step, you're going to try again. You're going to till this all up. You're going to plant new grass. And you're going to add some ruminants. So now we have grass cow world. What's the problem with grass cow world? It's going to be too many cows eventually. And so the grass is going to be Yeah, we're going to go back to grass world basically really, really quickly. So the cows are going to eat too much grass, they're going to overpopulate, the cows are going to die, the grass is going to die. So what if we introduced a predator? Now we've got a little bit more balance here. So we've got the predator keeping the herd in check, so it's not going to get too big because the wolves are going to cull the weaker ones, the older ones. Also, the animals are going to be on the move from the predator, so they're not going to overgraze any one specific area. They're going to be moving around constantly, which actually is much healthier for the pasture. Um, it's still kind of delicate. You don't want just three things, right? So complexity is actually the most resilient system that you can have. And I know, again, this is kind of a funny slide um, from like a, you know, elementary school 
uh, science class, but I wanted to show again how simple this is. And the more you know, varieties of cows or ruminants or animals you've got, the more different pollinators you have, is really how you're gonna build a truly resilient system. And that is just how nature works. And now humans can be that wolf, all right? And the cows can help us build complexity and resilience in a system. So we can, you know, through uh, mob grazing, intensive management, we can be moving the herd, um, which they would naturally bunch up anyway, right? Because that's how they're gonna be super safe. If they're super spread out, it's much easier for a wolf to pick them off. So they naturally want to be in a dense herd. Um, we can use electric fencing to move them around and keep them safe and keep the wolves out. And then we can choose which ones we're gonna cull. So that's how we can use cattle and bison and other ruminants um, through electric fencing and harvesting. Um, and here's a slide from the Savory Institute just showing a before and after um, of you know, reductionist thinking versus a more holistic thinking. So thinking in systems. But what about all the people that are you know, claiming that it takes so much land for cows and we should just be cropping it all? Um, so I'm trying to give you some arguments here, right? Some, some like defensive points. Uh, not all land can be cropped. And I would even argue most of the land that is cropped today should not be cropped as well. Um, pretty cool stuff going on in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, where we're filming with uh, Dr. Hallberg's clinic. It's corn country. And we're also filming with farmers who are turning the corn back to pasture and producing meat instead of corn. So healthier for people, healthier for the planet less fertilizer needed because it's getting naturally fertilized if the cattle are managed well. Um, but if you think about places like Norway or Iceland or most of Africa, you just can't grow kale or soybeans you know, in many, many places because of water issues, topography. There are so many reasons why an area can't be cropped well. Um, but even again, in the areas that are being cropped, California has a huge water problem there are towns that don't have drinking water, but yet we're diverting water from reservoirs to flood irrigate almonds to export our water, basically, to other countries through almonds. So most agricultural land is only suitable to pasture, so you're not comparing apples to apples when someone's saying, oh, well, you know, I can, I can have a pound of tofu for this much land versus you know, your pound of beef for that much land. It's really the cows are moving around, they're regenerating the land. No block of tofu is regenerating the land. Um, what about the water? I heard that, you know, it takes a kajillion gallons of water to produce um, an eight ounce steak. Um, most of the methodology they're using when they calculate out this water is completely flawed. So what they're looking at is every drop of rain uh, this is called green water versus blue water, okay? So green water is looking at natural rain that would have fallen on those pastures, whether or not it was grass world or, you know, cows actually grazing on it. And also, again, you're moving the cows, but unfortunately in a green water situation, you're calculating out all the rain that fell on all the pasture that the cow was on for their entire two years of life. So that's not fair, right? Um, when you actually look at the blue water, so that's like the water the, cattle's, the, the cow actually drank. Um, there's a study out of um, US, uh, UCSD, and it's 410 gallons of water for a feedlot cow. So that's even uh, looking at you know, cows that were finished on feedlots, so not even just a purely grass-fed system. So that's equivalent to the same amount of water it takes to produce almonds, rice, uh, many, many other crops. Okay, I got like 10 more slides left, but I'm gonna go pretty quickly. I've also calculated the feed conversion rate. Um, that methodology is incorrect as well. I have a really great um, blog post about how um, cows actually, when you look at the actual grain that they're eating, because all cows start out on grass, even if they do end up at a feedlot, they're eating a lot of crop residues like corn stalks and things like that because they're ruminants. They can't handle straight grain. Um, the, the numbers that you see where it's like you know 12 pounds of grain to a pound of beef is, is assuming that that cow for its entire life ate only grain. Not true. 
So it's not the cow, it's the how. I think we need more regenerative systems. I think we have created grass world with our modern farming techniques, and I think that lab meat is just the continuation of grass world. So we're just doomed with, with all right, I wanna stop. I promise, I'm gonna go really fast. Least harm, if you look at one of those grass world situations, there's a lot of harm that happens. If you think about all the pesticides, all the um, land that was cleared in the first place to make, make it a field. Um, if you look up the principle of least harm, you'll see numbers that someone calculated out. How many little critters die compared to one cow on grass that can provide 500 pounds of meat? Um, vegetarian India is seen as, you know, the holy, clean place, but you can only have a dairy system where you have meat eaters close by to eat the veal, right? So you can only have vegetarian India if you have the Muslims there to eat the meat. Uh, Americans spend too little on food. We're at the top there compared to all these other countries. I have another post where I went through Organic grass-fed beef is less expensive than all these things, okay? Um, I think we're disconnected from nature, no, no surprise there. I think we're way afraid of death, which is at the crux of um, our emotional issues around eating meat, and I think people think cows are the worst because they look closest to dogs. So the paradigm shift needs to be our separation and dominance and dominion over um, all other things to realizing our interconnectedness. So we need more, better meat. Now this is just something I came up with. Trying to think about nutrient density plus sustainability. Um, and uh, so you can see kind of my chart here. So even, even if you're in a grocery store and someone can't afford you know, grass-fed beef, which we saw at Walmart the other day when we were there, um, I still think feedlot beef is a better choice than CAFO chicken or pork for environmental, ethical, and nutritional reasons. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, questions at the mic, please. Hello. I, um, I heard that actually beef tallow, like grass-fed beef tallow, has a, almost a one-to-one -one omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And so y if you ate the whole cow, it seems like you wouldn't have to have seafood. I still would like to see the ratio of omega-3s in there, just because the, uh, the ratio to overall fat, right, in tallow is, is um, I don't know. I would have to look at, anyone here an expert in fat ratios? 1.4 No, not the ratio of omega-3 to, I'm talking about if we had a pie chart, okay, and we looked at, what percentage of tallow is actually polyunsaturated, I don't think it's a very significant part of it. Um, so I, I would just need to look at that because we need to look at like, even if it's double, if it's double, if it's two pennies versus one penny, it's still two pennies versus, you know, I could get five bucks out of salmon kind of thing. I, I think... I, I, I mean, yeah, tallow is a saturated, but it's not purely saturated. It's got other stuff in it too. Um, when we look at dairy, it's a little bit better. There is some more um, significance in milk, but there's issues with dairy too, so I, don't, I didn't bring that up here. I, I just wanted to jump in on that uh, because one of the parts of the cow that we rarely eat here in America is the brain, mm -hmm. and I think the brain has a lot more polyunsaturated fatty acids, so it might become significant again if you're looking at marrow and brain rather than just the muscle meat, where I agree with you that it's just... it's. The ratio doesn't even really matter that much because yeah. the amount is so small. Yeah, I mean, uh, where I'm at right now is trying to affect sort of massive change, and I just don't think leading with we need to eat more brain is going <laughs> to <laughs> move the needle very hard. Um, so, but yeah, I think we definitely need more organ meats. Um, uh, there's reasons why we, it's illegal to even t give the brain to a farmer uh, right now from a slaughterhouse. Um, so there's issues there. 
Thank you for all the things that you're doing. I'm so yep. glad you're making this public. Um, I was wondering if there's a cultural, uh, if there's a cultural model that has really sustainable, high protein, like a microsystem that has a, a, a model that we can look at for that anywhere in the world. You mean like a population that ate a lot of meat? Yeah, in a way, and, and farmed it and, and grew it. In Anyone pre-agricultural, pretty much. I mean, we, so, uh, you know, humans can exist on a large continuum of macronutrients, right? So we've got, you know, closer to the equator, it seems like people ate more starchy tubers and more carbohydrates, but then the further away from the equator, it was, you know, plants don't grow great when it's cold, sure. right? So, um, so they ate very, you know, of course, everyone's quotes that, you know, Inuit and the Maasai, right? It's like the meat cultures. But um, so humans who weren't living on the equator ate very large amounts of animal products to sustain them. Um, cool. Yes. Is there a superfood? I have like a couple really quick questions. A superfood, high protein, low calories, high micronutrients. Beef. Beef. <laughs> Beef. I love it. <laughs> and then how about um? How about uh, desalination? Do you do you look at that for water sources for for agriculture? Like uh, in terms of in terms of water, in terms of finding water for. Water is a huge issue, and it's going to be the next big issue. Um, I think uh, water, some water issues are sort of driving the, how, why they're using this funky methodology for beef and trying to blame beef on sucking up so much water um, and not accounting for the fact that cows pee, right? So it's like not, they're not just like balloons that are expanding. <laughs> um, so it, water is a huge issue, and in some areas, I know like in the southwest, the salt residues, it's a huge problem on, on the crop fields. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Just one last question. 